For those who disbelieve in our communications, we shall make them enter fire. So oft as their skins are thoroughly burned, we will change them for other skins that they may taste the chastisement. So says the Quran about the punishment for those who fall from the faith, apostates from Islam. But what's it like to stop being a Muslim in the West? There's a new book on the subject. Dr. Simon Cotty is a senior lecturer at Kent University. He's carried out an in-depth investigation into the social dynamics of those who've chosen to leave their Islamic faith behind. He conducted interviews with ex-Muslims from a variety of backgrounds in both the UK and Canada for his new book. There are certain themes in, in their narrative, certain common themes, and the first thing to flag up is doubt, I guess. It, it start, their stories basically start off, as they tell them, with, with doubt, with a feeling that something isn't quite right or that something doesn't ring true. And often some personal event or convulsion in, in their lives prompts them uh, to confront these doubts or, or sparks a doubt. It could be the loss of a friend or the death of a family member, the loss of a job, a relationship. First, they try and deal with it and, and, and put an end to their doubts. I mean, what, what struck me and, and what seemed very poignant was that many people I spoke to said that they that the aspiration of their young lives was to be good Muslims. And, and so they, they somehow something that their intellect or whatever it was wouldn't let them do that. And, and so these doubts intruded. It's interesting and, because you, you ask uh, at one stage, you say, actually, if you want to know the why of something like this, you don't ask why, you ask how. So how did sure. they actually come to, to leave? Yeah, I found that fascinating how they kind of use and appropriate the language of gay rights. And so they talk about the closet and they talk about coming out. Coming out refers to the disclosure of apostasy, telling friends and family, loved ones, that you no longer believe, that you're no longer a Muslim. Whereas the closet is all about uh, con concealment and staying in. And I, w I was really struck by how many people were uh, among the interviewees were, were in the closet, because well over half are actually in the closet, which means that they, they haven't told their close friends and, and family members, or maybe they've been selective and confided in one or two friends, but their family doesn't doesn't know. And so they basically live these double lives as, as secret ex-Muslims. But for uh, those who have come out, there, there are two sort of attitudes on them. One is a sense of sense of freedom that they once had a script, but now they, they don't. They're, they're yeah. essentially sort of liberated. But at the same time, there's a sense of loss. Absolutely. And, and so coming out is really a, a huge event in, in the lives or career of these ex-Muslims and they agonize over whether to do it, how to do it, how do you come out, how do you tell your parents that you no longer believe and how do you put that in a way that they're going to understand. And most of the people I spoke with who came out said that the response was, was very negative and, and so often they're condemned and in some cases ostracized by by the family. And so this this coming out has huge consequences because apostasy is a is a potent stigma within Muslim communities and and so that explains the the amount of secrecy surrounding it and and it's why many ex-Muslims don't actually come out. And but even but even those who do, sometimes mm. they, they get that initial sense of liberation, but it's just from, from reading what you, you've written. Yeah. But then sometimes living with it after that, they still feel as if they've got a sort of inner Muslim. I see, I see some people say they, they yeah. have to fight this inner Muslim and that, that particularly perhaps for women, um, the sense of modesty is difficult to get over. What happens is they leave Islam and there's a kind of existential crisis and crisis of identity. So, so they're thinking, well, who am I now? What, what do I do? I live my life in terms of, of religion and, and now it's not there. So there's this huge void. So what do they fill it with? And they don't have these, the, the scripts to deal with their new lives. And, and there's this kind of, I, in the book, I talk about the unlearning process. And, and yeah, many, many ex-Muslims still feel uh, in the thrall of, of Islam and it's in their speech, it's how they talk. And, and so they kind of remonstrate with themselves for, for thinking 
um, and talking as, as, as they did when they were Muslims. And they still feel guilt feelings related to, say, drinking or eating pork, which is forbidden in, in Islam, or dating. You're actually identified by others, by the, by the rest of society, the majority in society, by your name and by the way you look. And, and sure. they may have questions of you, you know, well, how come you're, yeah, you're eating a bacon sandwich or you're, or you're drinking alcohol? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And many of the people I spoke with in the closet expressed deep frustration about this because, and certainly for the women who are hijabed up or wearing their buyer Islamic clothing, you know, people make assumptions about them and think that they're uh, religious when actually... They're not, and they're in the closet. And, and I think that that's kind of exacerbating uh, for them that people make these assumptions. And, and often, I mean, some ex-Muslims I interviewed were considered within their own communities, religious communities, to be very righteous. And, and, and so they kind of felt this um, discrepancy because that's not who they actually are. Simon Cotty, his book, The Apostates, When Muslims Leave Islam, is published by 